Morning, church. It's good to see you. Y'all can go ahead and have a seat. Well, that's what, what we're gathered here to sing the praises of our Lord, to encourage and build up one another, to continue doing that. Um, this is one of the things that God has called us to do, not just by ourselves, but together. So, this is one of the great privileges of gathering uh, Sunday after Sunday to worship with one another. If you're a guest with us this morning, maybe this is your first or your second time uh, with us, we're glad that you're here. We would love to be able to get you a little bit of information about our church, and we'd love to be able to pray for you as well. And so you should be able to find a guest information card in the pew rack. It looks like this. If you would fill that out over the course of the service, we'd be really grateful uh, so that we can get you some information. There's also a prayer request slot there on the back where you can write things down, and we would love to be able to pray for you. And so if you would do that for us, We'd be really grateful. Um, VBS is also coming up sooner than we know. Uh, 
first full week in June is when VBS is. There is a sign-up sheet on the welcome table in the foyer. Um, I believe Gina will be out there after the service is over. If you have some questions about that, she can help get you signed up. Um, and while you're also at the sign up at the uh, welcome table, there are new church directories there that have been updated and are fresh and ready for you to have. Um, one of the really helpful things about the directory is it can be used for a couple different things. One, if you're just kind of flipping through it regularly, this is a really good way to get to know everybody's names. Um, you've all been there, I'm sure, when you walk up to somebody and your mind goes blank on who somebody is. And this is a good way for us to uh, be intentional about learning one another. But they're also really helpful prayer guides. And so if you ever find yourself uh, sitting down to pray and, and not sure what you might pray for that is outside of kind of the normal things that you pray for, a really good practice is to pray for those who we worship alongside of. And so you can pray through the directory, maybe just a page at a time, pray that God would bless these people, reveal himself to them, that he would build us up in unity and maturity. Those are really, really good uh, prayer guides for you. And so I uh, hope you will grab one of those today and make good use of it. Psalm 12 will be our first scripture reading this morning. Psalm 12 says this. Save, O Lord, for the godly one is gone, for the faithful have vanished from among the children of man. Everyone utters lies to his neighbor. With flattering lips and a double heart they speak. May the Lord cut off all flattering lips, the tongue that makes great boasts. Those who say, with our tongue we will prevail, our lips are with us. Who is master over us? Because the poor are plundered, because the needy groan, I will now arise, says the Lord. I will place him in the safety for which he longs. The words of the Lord are pure words, like silver refined in a furnace, on the ground purified seven times. You, O oh Lord, will keep them. You will guard us from this generation forever. On every side the wicked prowl as vileness is exalted among the children of man. Pray with me. Lord, you are righteous altogether. You do right, you demand right, and you judge when right is not done. That's who you are and and we praise you for that. For we would not want to serve a God who's not righteous. We would not want to serve a God who's not just. And so we praise you for who you are. Yet we also reckon with, with the psalmist and, and recognize that everyone utters lies to his neighbors. With flattering lips and a double heart, we speak. And so even as we cry out for you to do right and to do justice, we realize that that puts us in a dangerous position. And so we find ourselves freshly thankful for Jesus, for his death and his resurrection, for forgiveness and hope and life. And so this morning as we uh, sing praises to you, as we're invited to come and, and worship you, as we hear your word proclaimed and, and read before us, I pray that you would stir our hearts, that you would stir our affections, that we might come to love you more than we love or care about anything else in the world. Would that change and transform us to be not people who utter lies, but who cry out for you uh, to show up, that, that we might have pure words, that we might lean on you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand again.
So 
morning, church. This morning, we'll continue praying through the Lord's Prayer. Um, it's something familiar to many of us who grew up in the church, and so words that are familiar tend to get lost. Uh, we're highlighting different ways that the Lord's Prayer teaches us how to pray, and this week we'll be talking about how it teaches us to petition. The Baptist Catechism would talk about six different petitions that are included in the Lord's Prayer. First, hallowed, that God would enable us to glorify him. Second, Thy kingdom, I think any of us that live a human life yearn for his kingdom to come. And so we ask for that, that God's will be done. Same thing. Uh, that the daily portion of the things that we need, that daily bread, would be provided to us. That God would forgive us our sins and that he would enable us to forgive others, which is often so hard to do. And lastly, that he would protect us from sin and deliver us out of sins that we are in. So the things that we ask reflect God's character, and when we pray these types of things, these are prayers that God has answers. So let's pray these words together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
be seated. As you do, join me in prayer. O oh, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Let your name be hallowed in all of creation. Let your name be treated as holy among all the nations. Let your glory be seen and known and embraced to the ends of the earth. Oh God, let your gospel, the good news of Christ crucified and risen, be spread far and wide that the nations might be glad. Lord, we thank you this morning that the, that the gospel has reached even us. Thank you for the missionaries, evangelists, who have taken this gospel literally around the globe so that we right here in central Texas can know and believe in Jesus. God, we pray that this unfinished task would be taken up by us and that you would empower us and fill us with your spirit that we might declare hallowed be your name to the ends of the earth. Oh God, your will be done. Your kingdom come. We need you. Help us to do your will as it's done in heaven. Help us to exalt and praise and worship you with everything that we do with everything that we are. God, I pray this morning you would rescue us from small dreams. Give us a grand ambition to make much of Jesus with every breath and every second and every opportunity you've given us in our day. Lord, help us, save us, redeem us from wasting our lives on trivialities and consume us with your heart, with your passion to see the nations glad in Jesus. Lord, we need you. We pray you'd open your word to us this morning and that you'd speak to us and conform us to the image of Jesus. We pray you'd do that in Jesus' great name. Amen. Amen. So good to see you. Grab a Bible and turn with me to the awesome letter to the Romans, chapter 15. By the way, how many of you are still using the Roman scripture journals? Hold it up. Let me see it. There's a good number of you. I like it. I like it a lot. Just FYI, in about a month when we finish the book of Romans, I'm thinking about maybe having a gift, a small gift for those of you who can show me your completed Roman scripture journals or close to completed. I just kind of want to see those and what they look like with all of your, your notes and all of your scribbles and underlines and everything in those, and so be listening for more details on that. Well, in our study of the book of Romans, we're beginning our final descent into landing this plane. Paul has finished laying out the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ, and he has finished formally exhorting us to be living sacrifices for the glory of God. He is now going to finish this great letter with some personal remarks about his ministry and his plans, and he's going to leave them with some final greetings as he says goodbye. But even though Paul is about to land this plane, there is still a tremendous amount in, these la in this last chapter and a half, and so keep your seatbelt fastened as we believe all Scripture is God-breathed, even these, these very mundane comments about his travel plans and his future and his greetings to the people in Rome. We believe that all scripture is profitable and useful to build us up in the faith. And so this morning, Romans chapter 15, verses 14 through 21, follow along in your copy. Paul says, I myself am satisfied about you, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness filled with all knowledge and able to instruct one another. But on some points I've written to you very boldly by way of reminder because of the grace given me by God to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles in the priestly service of the gospel of God so that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit, in Christ Jesus, then, I have reason to be proud of my work for God. 
for I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience by word and deed, by the power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem all the way around to Illyricum, I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ. And thus I make it my ambition to preach the gospel, not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation, but as it is written, those who have never been told of him will see, and those who have never heard will understand. This is God's inerrant word. May he equip us for every good work through it. So notice in verse 14 that Paul encourages his readers with his confidence in them. He maybe is wondering how they have taken what he has written to them. And so he takes a step back and he encourages them. He calls them, notice, brothers. He says that he is satisfied about them, that they are full of goodness. They are filled with all knowledge in such a way that they're able to instruct one another. They are mature, Paul says. This is an encouragement he gives them. We would all long to hear about our church. Are we full of goodness? Are we filled with all gospel knowledge? And are we able to instruct one another? This is actually one of my goals as a pastor. My goal is not just to instruct us, but my goal is to help us be equipped to another. How much more ministry and maturity could happen if you and I were instructing one another constantly. May God do this for us. May he fill us with all goodness. May he fill us with all gospel knowledge and with all good things that we might be able to instruct one another. Well, Paul gives this encouragement, but then in verse 15, he reminds them that he has written boldly to them on some points. Paul's goal has been to spur them on. He has been bold in reminding them of the truth of the gospel and of human sinfulness and of the call of the gospel on our lives. He has particularly been bold in calling Jew and Gentile to consider the needs of one another. He's been bold to call them to lay down their rights and to, to sacrifice their preferences for one another. And so Paul encourages them. He reminds them that he has written boldly. And then the rest of this passage, Paul underlines his calling to do this. He underlines his calling to write the book of Romans and to instruct them in this bold way. He says he's written this letter as an authoritative apostle of Jesus, which is the way he started in Romans chapter 1, verse 1. And as Paul writes about his calling in this passage, I think he teaches us what it looks like to have a life fully devoted to God's purposes. He shows us some principles of living on mission with God and giving ourselves to God as living sacrifices. And so I sort of view this passage and these last few passages in the book of Romans as an opportunity for us to peek into the window of a life that was presented to God as a living sacrifice by his mercy. We get a real live example of what Paul has been calling us to in this second part of the book of Romans. Notice in verse 20 that Paul calls this passion he has, he calls it, an ambition. He says he makes it his ambition to preach the gospel where Christ has not been named. This word ambition means to earnestly desire something, to give yourself wholeheartedly to something. This is Paul's all-consuming ambition. For Paul, that ambition was frontier missions. He was specifically called by God to be an apostle to the Gentiles. He did this by planting and strengthening churches so that the gospel would take root in a city and then spread all around the globe. We don't all have to have Paul's exact same ambition, 
Not all of us can be pioneer church planners and go to unreached people groups. In fact, Paul is not saying that all the members of the church in Rome should have his exact same ambition. In fact, he's going to call in the next passage, he's going to call the church in Rome to support him in this ambition. So some people make it their ambition to go, and some people make it their ambition to support. Some people blaze a new trail, and some people build on the foundation that's already been laid. We don't all have Paul's same ambition, but we should have a similar, all-encompassing gospel ambition for our lives. We should all have an all-encompassing gospel ambition for the life that God has given to us. An ambition that consumes us like it consumed Paul. As believers, we should labor and sacrifice for something so great, something so grand that it consumes everything we do. This is what it means to be a living sacrifice. You remember chapter 12, verse 1? Present your bodies, present your whole selves as living sacrifice. This is your spiritual worship. It means everything is devoted to God's purpose and God's calling on our lives. Not every Christian is a Paul. But by God's grace, every one of us should have a massive gospel ambition that we devote ourselves fully to. So what is your all-encompassing ambition. What is your ambition in life? Or maybe a better way for you to get at knowing what that is is to say, what would the people around you say is your all-consuming ambition? What would people around you say you're living for? This is what he or she wants more than anything else. This is what he or she is aiming at in their lives. What's that ambition for you? Well, let's look in this passage and let's see what we can learn about having a gospel ambition. Not selfish or ungodly ambition, but to have an ambition that is centered around Christ and his mission. Let's allow Paul's example to challenge us to refocus our lives on the all-encompassing ambition that we've been called to in Jesus. And so I want to highlight three characteristics of a gospel ambition from this passage. What does a gospel ambition look like? Number one, gospel ambition aims for God to be worshipped. Gospel ambition has an aim, and that aim is that God be worshipped, that God be given the praise that is due him. This is the way Paul speaks of his calling here in this passage. Notice in verse 16, this calling is very unique that he shares. He views himself as something of a priest who is offering acceptable sacrifices to God. Notice what he says. At the end of verse 15, he makes clear that it's God's grace that has called him to this task. Paul has not earned this privilege. It was given to him by grace. And in verse 16, he says his calling, this grace-given calling, is to be a minister of Christ to the Gentiles. Now, that word minister is not the same word we think of when we think of like a vocational minister today. Now, this word for minister is actually a very unique word that was used exclusively to refer to serving in the temple. It's a word designed to conjure images of worship. And then notice Paul makes clear how he views his labor by saying, in the priestly service of the gospel of God. My role, my calling is to be a minister in the priestly service of the gospel of God. Now, Paul is not saying he is a priest. Paul knows that Jesus, as our great high priest, is the only priest that we need. But Paul's ambition is to, is to present a priestly offering of worship to God. He understands his ambition in life to be offering acceptable sacrifices to God for God's glory. As Paul argued in the last passage that we looked at last week, Jesus came so that Gentiles would glorify God. This is why Christ came. 
And Paul sees himself as serving that grand purpose. When Paul shares the gospel, when Paul plants churches that reach Gentiles, Paul sees that as an offering that is pleasing in God's sight. In other words, the goal of all of Paul's labor is the worship of God. God not being worshipped in the world is what troubles Paul. This Paul's goal is to God to be given the worship in the world that he deserves. And so that's what his ambition is about. When Gentiles trust and obey God by faith, Paul sees that as a pleasing aroma to God. Paul is offering Gentile converts on the altar as his spiritual worship. What if we had this perspective of our lives? What if we could somehow begin to see all of our life and all of our labor as an offering of worship to the holy God of all creation? Like what if you and I woke up every morning and devoted ourselves and all that we were to do that day to the worship of God? What if we saw Cookies bake for a neighbor as a sacrifice on God's altar. What if we saw a meal delivered to a sick church member as a priestly offering to God? What if we saw volunteering to serve in the nursery or at vacation Bible school as a liturgy to God? What if we saw engaging a coworker with the truth of the gospel as a song sung? around the throne of God? What if a well-taught Bible study class was seen as a sweet fragrance to God? You see, Paul had a sacred, reverent view of his life and labor. He wanted God to be glorified more than anything else in all the world. He wasn't offering animal sacrifices to God, but he was offering converted Gentiles as acceptable sacrifices. Friends, I think if we had this kind of all-encompassing gospel ambition, it would free us from the mundane, unexciting, unengaged, boring lives we often live. If we took 1 Corinthians 10.31 seriously, there would never be a boring moment of our lives. 1 Corinthians 10.31 So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. In Romans chapter 12, verse 1, Paul called us by the mercies of God to present ourselves as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is our spiritual worship. Church, it's not only who we are, but also what we do that we present to God for the fame of his name. In other words, aim to glorify God in all of your life, in all of your labor, in all that you do. Listen, if your life's ambition doesn't aim at God being worshipped, your ambition is too small. If this isn't the ultimate aim of who you are and why you do what you do, then your life ambition is too small. So this is what a gospel ambition is. It aims at God being worshipped. Here's the second characteristic of a gospel ambition we learn from this passage. Gospel ambition gladly gives all credit for success to our triune God. This is really a subset of the first characteristic, but it's true. Gospel ambition gladly gives all credit for success to our triune God. As Christians, we believe that there is one God who exists in three persons. The Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God, but there are not three gods, but one God triune God. And in this passage, Paul exults in the work of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Notice that in verse 15, Paul says his ministry was given to him by the grace of God. In other words, Paul didn't choose this like we choose a vocation. 
This was amazing grace from God that was given to him. And so he views all of his ministry as a gift of God's grace. Also, look at the end of verse 16. After describing his priestly ministry, offering Gentiles as acceptable sacrifice of worship, he adds, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. I'm offering these gifts, these offerings, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. So Paul is laboring for Gentiles to be converted, but it's the Spirit specifically who sanctifies Paul's offering. In other words, apart from the transforming work of the Spirit, the offering would not be acceptable. The offering would not be pleasing in God's sight. The Gentiles would not be sanctified, and Paul's labor would be in vain. Also look at verse 18. Paul says that he dare not speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through him. I dare not speak of anything except for what Jesus has accomplished. And so you see what Paul is doing. He's giving all credit for his success to God, specifically God the Son, the Lord Jesus. So notice it. It's the Father's grace to give Paul this ministry. The Holy Spirit does the transforming work of sanctifying the offering. And Jesus is the one who accomplishes all of this good work. Paul's all-encompassing gospel ambition is Trinitarian. He is commissioned by the Father, empowered by the Spirit, and exulting in the enablement of Jesus to do anything good, to do anything that would please God. This humbles Paul. And notice in verse 17 what he says about his work. And notice Paul is not boasting in himself. Paul is not boasting in his own work. He says he is proud of his work for God. And when he says that, he makes clear that it's not pride in himself or pride in what he's done in his own strength. How is he proud? Notice it. He is proud in Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus, then, I am I have, no, I have reason to be proud of my work for God. It is in Christ that he is proud. Friends, it is good and right to be proud of what God accomplishes through you in Jesus. And right to celebrate what God does through you in Jesus. Because what we do in Jesus resounds to his glory, not our own. Any credit for fruit, any credit for success, in all of our lives is God's, and we are foolish to take it for ourselves. In all of our obedience, in all of our sacrifice, it is God at work enabling us so that when we boast, our boast is in him alone. That's what Paul is proud of. That's what he is speaking about. He says he refuses to speak of anything except what Jesus has accomplished through him in verse 18. Friends, what would it look like if you and I had this kind of all-encompassing ambition that gave all credit to God? We should talk like this, friends. Here's one of the ways we can help one another in community. We should talk like this. Whenever we do something for God, anything, we should say, look what Jesus has done. Look what the Spirit enabled me to do. Look what grace God has given me. When we see fruit from our labors, we should be quick to give all credit to our triune God. When you teach a good lesson to kids, you should thank Jesus for what he did. When you perform a, success, a successful surgery, you should marvel at the grace given to you. When you sell a quality product at a fair price that helps people, you should feel the favor of God empowering you. Notice that Paul is glad to give all credit to God. Sometimes we want to give credit, but it's kind of begrudgingly. <laughs> Not Paul. He's proud. He's eager to give all glory to the triune God. We also see Paul's gladness in the fact that he highlights some of how God accomplished this work through him. In verses 18 and 19, he says, God accomplished this work through him. In other words, what did you do, Paul? What was your role, Paul? Notice what he says at the end of verse, the end of verse 18. He brought the Gentiles to obedience by word and deed. These 
these are the means of Paul's ministry. Here's what Paul did, word and deed. By word, I think Paul is highlighting his preaching of the gospel. Verse 20 says his ambition was to preach the gospel where Christ is not known. We must preach the gospel in missions and evangelism. I don't think many of you know how controversial this statement is. Apart from the word of God, there can be no faith in God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. How can they hear unless someone preaches? Words. Paul was doggedly committed to preaching the truth of the gospel. The statement that sometimes is associated with St. Francis of Assisi is not something he said, and it's not biblical. Preach the gospel always, and if necessary, use words. That would have been unintelligible to Paul. How do you preach the gospel without words? That is not a biblical statement. God's mission requires the preaching of the gospel with words. The gospel is news. It's message. It's historical. This is what happened. This is who God is. It must be declared. And so, friends, whatever ambition God has given to us, that ambition must include the declaration of Jesus with words. But it's not just the preaching of the gospel. Paul says, by word and deed. And I think he defines some of what those deeds were in verse 19. By the power of signs and wonders. By the power of the Spirit of God. And so deeds, actions, support the truth we preach. Our deeds done in the power of the Spirit testify to the truthfulness of the words we preach. For Paul and the early apostles, God used lots of miracles, lots of signs, lots of wonders to confirm that what they were preaching is true. And God can and still does use signs and wonders today. And we pray he would keep doing that and do that all the more. But friends, he's also called his people to live holy lives that testify to the truth of the gospel. He's called us to live out this gospel in our everyday lives to support what we proclaim. It's an awesome miracle of God's grace. It's a sign and a wonder when people like you and I, as followers of Jesus, live lives of obedience that commend our king. It's a miracle that that happens. It is only by the Spirit's empowerment that you and I can live lives that commend the truth of the gospel. So understanding word and deed in the power of the Spirit as the means of missions, as the means of evangelism, I think helps define what success looks like in our lives. What are we supposed to be doing? Like, what's the actual, what, what are we supposed to be doing? Well, if we, if we give all glory to God, if we give all credit to Him in all of our words and all of our deeds, what we do resounds to His glory and it redefines for us what faithfulness looks like. You see, if we attach success to our fruit, we're going to be incredibly disappointed. But God gives the growth. God gives the growth. This should liberate us, friends. Our role is to be faithful, preach the gospel, and live faithful lives, planting and watering, planting and watering. And friends, this should give massive humility to us and confidence in the ambition that God has called us to by word and by deed. Listen, he has not called us to preach and live in our own power. He's not called us to do it ourselves. That would be sad news. That would be burdening news this morning. But rather, he provides the strength and he gives the growth and he gives the success. And so, friends, this is what gospel ambition is. Gospel ambition gladly gives all credit for success to our triune God. Don't boast in yourself. Don't boast in what you do. Give all glory to God alone. It is his. So the third and the final characteristic I want you to see in this passage is gospel ambition focuses on ultimate need. Gospel ambition focuses on ultimate need. Now church, if I communicate this point as I see it in the text, I think this should be jarring for us. Because what I want to communicate is this. 
God doesn't give his people meaningless ambitions. God doesn't give ambitions that are meaningless, that are pointless. All-encompassing gospel ambitions aim to meet real need in the world. You see, gospel ambition is born out of love for others. And so if your ambition, listen, is to exalt yourself, if your ambition is to climb some ladder, if your ambition is to gather a certain amount of materials, then your ambition is not from God. God gives ambition that sees real need and seeks to meet that need. So what was the need that Paul was passionate about meeting? Notice verse 20 again. Paul says, And thus I make it my ambition to preach the gospel, not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation. Imagine this. Paul lived in a world, and we still live in a world, where people exist who have never heard the name of Jesus. Paul opened his eyes and he saw that there were people who were born, lived an entire life, died, having never heard the name of Jesus. He looked around and he saw this ultimate need. People don't know about Jesus. And because of that need and because of the truth of the scripture, verse 21, where he quotes from Isaiah 52, Paul made it his ambition to preach the gospel where, where Christ had never been named, where people had never heard. Remember in Romans chapter 1, Paul made very clear that every person, regardless of location, regardless of gender, regardless of ethnicity, every person is accountable to God because God has made himself known to everyone. Remember this phrase? All people are without excuse, Paul said, even if they've never heard about Jesus. And so Paul believed that the only hope people who have never heard of Jesus have is for someone to tell them about Jesus. The gospel is the power of God for salvation, and no one is saved apart from the gospel. And so Paul's all-encompassing ambition in life was not to build on someone else's foundation, but to preach the gospel where no one had ever preached before. Now again, Paul's specific ambition is not to be all of our ambitions. I pray there are some who have Paul's same ambition. I pray there are some in this room who God lays this calling on your life. There are 3.5 billion people who live today who have zero access to the gospel. No churches, no scripture, no Christians, no gospel. Someone needs to make it their ambition to preach the gospel where Christ is not named in the world. But even though God has not called us all to this exact same ambition, we have all been called to an ambition that aims at this ultimate need every person has to know and trust Jesus. Friends, there is not a greater need in all the world. There is not a greater need in the entire world than the need of people to hear about King Jesus. So whatever your ambition in life, whatever it is you're going after, does it aim people being saved from the wrath of God through the work of Jesus? Is your ambition in life too small? Your ambition shouldn't be merely to be the CEO of a large company. It should be to use that position to proclaim the gospel. Your ambition shouldn't be merely to be a professional athlete. It should be to use that platform as an athlete to declare the saving power of Jesus. Your ambition shouldn't be merely to retire and take life easy. It should be to use your time and resources to meet people's need for the gospel. Some of us need to open our eyes and see the need around us and change our life's ambition. That's what I've been praying for this week, that this morning God would change some of our ambitions. 
that we were heading one way, going after something that's far too small for a child of God, and that God would set us on the trajectory of the all-encompassing ambition that we've all been called to have. God has called us all to be consumed with meeting the need that everyone has for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, before I ask some some evaluative questions, I want you to see something else about this great need that Paul saw. I want us to see how Paul understood the best way to fulfill this God-given ambition. And I think there's a lesson here for us. Notice that Paul says in verse 19 that from Jerusalem all the way around to Illyricum, he has fulfilled his ministry. Now listen, we're going to see next week in verse 23 that Paul goes even further with this statement and he says there's no more work for him in this area. He has fully exhausted his calling in these areas. This is an absolutely amazing statement. Like, let's throw a map up on the screen just to, I don't know if you can see it or not, but it, it captures just how much area there was between Jerusalem and Illyricum. All of that area, there are a lot of people in that area, and there are a lot of cities in that area, and Paul says he's done with that. He has fully preached the gospel in that entire area. How can he say that? How can he say that there's no more work left to do in that area? We know everyone in that area is not a Christian. Paul writes to Timothy and tells Timothy to do the work of an evangelist. That means there are people Timothy needs to evangelize. What does Paul mean? Well, what Paul means is that this area now already has gospel witness. You see, Paul has spent more than a decade planting churches in this area. And he has strengthened those churches to be healthy gospel witnesses to this entire area. And so Paul's mission strategy was to plant churches in big cities, and then those churches were to radiate the gospel outward. And so I think one of the implications of this statement is that the Great Commission is accomplished through local churches. The Great Commission is accomplished through local churches. Paul didn't just preach from house to house or or business to business. No, he established churches that would be the gospel witness in this area. And so it's not that there's no more unbelievers to evangelize in this area, but rather those unbelievers now have gospel witness. They have churches around them to spread the gospel to them. And so Paul wants to move on to preach the gospel, to plant churches where there are no gospel churches. So we could say that according to Paul, one of the greatest needs in the world is the planting and strengthening of local churches. One of the greatest needs in all the world is the planting and strengthening of local churches. It is through gospel-centered churches that those who have never been told of Jesus will see and those who have never heard will understand. Verse 21, may God give us a gospel ambition that seeks to meet the ultimate need that every person has in all the world. Well, let me offer two evaluative questions as we conclude. I want you to ask yourself these questions. First, what is your ambition in life? What is your ambition? Or maybe I should even ask before that, do you even have an ambition? It's common today for people just to sort of float along, coast along with no ambition at all. But if you have an ambition, what is it? What do you dream about? What what do you sacrifice for? What consumes you? What do you want more than anything else in life? What is your ambition? And after you consider honestly 
what your ambition is. Secondly, ask yourself this question. Does your ambition include God being glorified and people hearing about Jesus? Does your life ambition include God being glorified and people hearing about Jesus? Church, I pray that you allow Paul's example to free you from small ambitions. You see, I think having a grand, all-encompassing ambition is the most freeing thing in all the world. I think people view life mainly as a boring cycle of the same old thing every day, endless toil, endless drudgery, but not Paul. Paul didn't see life like that. Paul looked forward to spending the rest of his life in fruitful labor for the Lord Jesus Christ. Did you know when Paul wrote this, he is probably about 60 years old when he wrote this. In a world where people didn't live to be 90, Paul, in every sense of the word, would have been considered by us a senior citizen. And here he is saying, I still got work to do. I still have an ambition. I still want my life to count for something. Friends, you aren't too old and you aren't too young to have an all-encompassing gospel ambition for the rest of your life, however many more days God gives you. I urge you, I plead with you, don't spend your life just getting by with the bare minimum. Spend your life in fruitful labor for the glory of King Jesus. One of the quotes that has, has been so helpful to me over the last 20, 30 years, I've had it on the, the wall of my study for the last at least 11 years. I'm going to put it up on the screen. And I'm just going to let you, I'm going to let you settle in it. But it says this, just one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Jesus will last. Father, Thank you for these one lives you've given us. And life's like a vapor, here today, gone tomorrow. And so, Lord, would you help us to be fully engaged in making much of Jesus with these brief breath vapor lives you've given us. Oh, God, I pray that you would rescue us from trivial ambitions and help us all to have an ambition to see you worshiped and to see people know Jesus. Oh God, I pray that that would be the ambition of this church to take up this unfinished task and to make it our passion, to make it the all-consuming ambition of our lives. Help us by your grace and for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and sing, facing a task unfinished.
read the benediction from Psalm 90 and pray this prayer for us. I want to say if you're here and you don't know Jesus as your Savior, we would love to talk with you more about that. You can come see me. Any member of our church would be happy to talk to you about the glorious gospel of Jesus and how you can be saved from your sin and know God for all eternity. Psalm 90, verses 16 and 17. Let your work be shown to your servants and your glorious power to their children. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and establish the work of our hands upon us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. You are sent. Have a great day. He would say